Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where from where you're watching us to, today. Uh, and welcome to the second CRISP uh, webinar. Uh, my name is Susanna Zamataro. I'm the Director General at the International Road uh, Federation, and I'll be your moderator uh, today. Before we get started, a couple of housekeeping rules to uh, just make sure that uh, we have um, a smooth uh, uh, webinar today. Uh, you all the participants joining us today, you are being uh, muted by default. Um, please use the question and answer section to put forward uh, your questions. You will see them that function at the bottom normally of your, of your um, Zoom screen and navigation uh, bar. Uh, please use the, uh, the chat uh, if you want to share comments uh, during the presentations uh, throughout the webinar, if you want to share information. But please make sure you use the question and answer function, uh, function to put forward your questions. And I kindly ask you as well, if you're addressing your questions specifically to one of the speaker, speakers, please say so right at the beginning. Um, if you're using the um, social, media, uh, social media handles, uh, please use the hashtag Chris's uh, project. Uh, the webinar is being uh, recorded and rest reassured, we'll be sharing with you the slides and the uh, recording uh, right after the, the meeting and no need to write to us, you'll be notified uh, automatically. Now, let me, let me introduce you uh, the speakers today. I, I've just uh, introduced myself, uh, Susanna De Mataro, Director General of the International Road Federation, and I'll be the moderator for this session today. I have the honor and pleasure of having with me today Dr. Gurmel Gatahora from the University of uh, Birmingham and Professor, Professor Ramnasami Munyandi from the University of uh, Putra, Malaysia. And let me uh, make justice, if I can, quickly to our speakers with a few words on their um, experience on the, on the bio. Dr. Gurmel is the team's materials uh, expert. He holds a PhD in, in geotechnical and engineering. He has been working in the geotechnical engineering industry and academia for 74 um, years. He has an extensive international experience of materials uh, testing, both laboratory and in the field, um, ground improvement, use of out, out of specification materials in construction and improvement of roads and railways, and ex extensive laboratory uh, research um, as well. He runs a number of, of laboratory testing um, contracts for the industry, and uh, he has published uh, two books on materials and transportation geotechnics. Um, he has over 140 peer-reviewed journal and conference uh, papers. There's a lot more to that, um, but uh, you will be able to find out more about uh, the um, uh, the, um, the bio of the speakers of today on the uh, project website. I welcome as well Professor Ratnasamy. Uh, he's the, um, the UAPM lead. He has 27 years uh, research and teaching experience in highway transportation engineering. He's a vice president of the Asian Pavement Engineering Society and specializes in working with industry and road authorities to develop innovative climate resilient and sustainable technologies with a focus on asphalt, road pavement layers, and recyclable uh, waste materials. Um, he has worked with partners in six countries on topics including the development of new road patching materials in Australia, binder mix evaluation for airport runaways projects in Indonesia, um, in Singapore, and in many other uh, countries. Uh, without um, further ado, let me as well um, uh, run you through the agenda quickly for uh, today. After this quick uh, opening and introductory remarks, I will pass the floor, uh, the floor to Dr. Gurmel uh, to provide us an overview of the CRISP uh, project. Then Professor Ratnasamy uh, will uh, give an extensive presentation on fiber mastic asphalt uh, technology we will make sure we have some time in the end, um, at the end of this um, uh, first bunch of presentations for a question and answer and some discussion with all of you, the participants. And last but not least, um, we kindly ask you to stay with us um, at the end for a, a couple of few uh, more minutes 
to uh, fill in the evaluation uh, form. It's extremely important for us to get some feedback on what we are doing and how we are shaping this, um, uh, these events. Um, if my computer sees me, <laughs> I think that's my last slide. Mm, this is not moving here. No, this is not my last slide. A couple of more points uh, to your attention. And I will remind that back at the end of the, of the session, know that there's, you will be able to find some more information about the, um, the project on the two websites that you see on the screen, one which is hosted um, within the University of Birmingham. Um, you will find some information, but most of it, the proceedings as well of the webinars on the IRF. Uh, website. Know as well that you can um, get on board and involve, get involved uh, with the project uh, through the LinkedIn uh, dedicated LinkedIn group. You will see the link at the um, at the bottom of of uh, the screen. Please use uh, that that um, that uh, uh, group to connect to exchange with us to um, ask questions as well. Maybe we won't have um, enough time today to uh, address all of your questions. Make sure you, you, uh, you use the LinkedIn group to reach out uh, to us. With this, I'll, um, I'll uh, stop sharing my screen. And without further ado, I will uh, now pass the floor to Dr. Gurmel Gatahora for an introduction on the um, CRISPS uh, project. Gurmel, um, hello. You I will. Your slides. Thank you. I'll just attempt to share the screen. Okay. Can you all see the screen? Yes. All good. Excellent. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm going to provide a brief introduction into the to this project. Um, uh, as you've heard about me, I'm um, at the University of Birmingham. And I'm one of the researchers on this project. So the, a little bit of background. Uh, a little while ago, there was a high volume transport research project. And uh, at the end of that research project, a number of areas were identified, which included uh, further, which needed further research. And uh, one of the themes identified was how could new ways of designing and building roads using new standards and marginal materials deliver low maintenance, resilient road, roads economically. And this project addresses this. So the uh, project is uh, led by the University of Birmingham uh, with Dr. Burrow and myself. And Dr. Burrow is the principal investigator. I apologize, he can't be here at the, uh, today. He's out inspecting roads in Birmingham. Um, we also have uh, Dr. Carl Weldon from astronomy and his role will become quite clear shortly. Also, we have International Development Department, Ms. Zenobia Ismail and her role is also, will also become clear shortly. We also have uh, other international partners and they are the University of Auckland, namely work led by Dr. Tunes Henning and the UPM from Malaysia. And we have with us today, Dr. Professor Ratnasami Munyandi, who is going to give the main talk today. And finally, uh, and I say use that, uh, perhaps I should put that in inverted commas because there are a few of people who've joined us. We have uh, International Road Federation uh, through done by Susanna Zamataro, who you heard a few seconds ago. So what's the project about? It's about climate resilient, sustainable road pavement engineering surfacing, and the acronym for that is CRISPS. It's an 18 month project, which will assess suitability of three best global practice types of road surfacing for use in low income countries. And the aim here is to look at these techniques which will counter impact of climate change. So what are the three uh, types of road surfacings? Two of them are epoxy based. So they are epoxy modified chip seal, modified epoxy asphalt surfaces. And the third one is fiber mastic asphalt. 
These technologies are a result of many years of research in New Zealand and Malaysia. And this research has been undertaken in laboratories and there have been field trials. These techniques are now in, uh, used routinely in service. But why would you use them routinely? Well, only if we can show that there is whole life cost saving uh, in using them. So that's the last item. So how are we going about with this project? Well, there are four key elements here. The first one is deterioration modeling. And this is work uh, going, which is going to be led by New Zealand and Malaysia. And uh, these teams will look at all the data we have for the laboratory work and the trials that have been done, develop regression models, assess impact of external factors and come up with some guidance for um, constructing full-scale trials, and that's the work package for models for Ethiopian condition. The second work package looks at life cycle model. This work will be led by the University of Birmingham, and this will include calibration of HDM4 and looking at, through looking at scenario analysis. Before I talk about constructability, we have a work package three, which we have only put a title that it's called anti-fraud framework. This work will be looking at how we can check the um, 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 a mixed design or composition of the mastic materials. And we're using um, uh, neutron beams in, the, in, the, in our physics department to do that. And we're also doing some chemical tests which are going to be undertaken in the School of Chemistry at the university. The final work package is about constructability. Having got the um, models uh, development from the, uh, for Ethiopian conditions from our work stream one and life cycle modeling from work stream, work stream two, the aim is to use, um, the, uh, uh, is to use this know-how and construct trials in Ethiopia. We have selected sections of roads and we're at the moment putting together specifications for site selection and construction. So the final package, the work stream four, will be led by the Ethiopian Road Authority with a lot of support from us clearly, and of course the rest of the team from Malaysia and New Zealand. So where is the innovation? Assessing suitability of global materials, best practice for using uh, epoxy materials in pavements and fiber mastic asphalt in low uh, income countries. Second one is development of models of behavior of the three technologies under a variety of conditions, current conditions and future environmental conditions, traffic conditions, which are found in high volume roads in low income countries in Africa and in South Asia. There is also going to be a scoping exercise to identify existing chip seals in low income countries that are at risk and could benefit from the new technologies for existing or new roads. The development of life cycle models for these technologies considering the effect of climate change, both for construction of new roads and for resurfacing as in overlays. Then we have a post scoping inexpensive anti-fraud in situ testing methodologies for epoxy materials based on neutron, neutron beam particle analysis. And this work will be undertaken in principally in our physics department with a little bit of input from our chemical engineering department. Finally, trialing innovative, low cost, easy application methods for the three technologies. So that's in brief is uh, what our project is about. Uh, with that, I will stop and pass you on to uh, Susanna Zamataro. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gurma, for, um, um, for this introduction. I'll kindly ask you to stop sharing your screen. Thank you very much. While we give now uh, the floor to Professor Ratna, who will give us an extensive presentation on this new um, technology. 
Professor Ratna, I see you're trying to get on the screen. In the meantime, let me um, let me remind to all the participants, and I'm I'm so grateful to see so many of you joining us this uh, this morning this morning in Geneva, uh, please use the question and answer function at the bottom of your, um, in your Zoom navigation bar to put forward some, some question and answers to our speakers or in general um, <clears throat> on, on, uh, on the project and then use the chat if you uh, have any comments or knowledge or uh, information to share with us. Professor Ratna, see you already. The floor is yours, and I will uh, mm -hmm. allow me to play the copy in the room, and I will give you a sign five minutes before okay. the um, the time is uh, is over, so that we, we make sure we have some time at the end. Thank you very much. Thank you, Miss Susanna, and a very good afternoon to everyone who are in the uh, virtual seminar here. Uh, it is afternoon here, and I'm sure in many places you have mornings and nights, and uh, thank you for being with us. And uh, I'm going to take you through this uh, new novel fibermetric asphalt technology and how it can be implemented in other countries where we have, you know, uh, problems like environment, you know, overloading kind of uh, situations. So uh, I think the time is not that long, and I have to be very careful about uh, not getting excited about, you know, uh, presenting for hours. So I'll try to keep this as straightforward and simple as possible. Okay, so now I, I've already touched on this before, all right, about the uh, climatic situation in Malaysia and how fibermetric asphalt has become quite important and, uh, a, a, uh, you know, the way to go forward with the, uh, given situations like overloading and other problems with, uh, faced by the road industry. So what you are looking at here is the uh, climatic conditions in Malaysia, all right? Rainfall, uh, you know, that sums up to more than uh, nearly, nearly uh, 2,500 mm of rainfall and the temperature can hit, you know, like 37 degrees to 37, 38, 39, probably sometimes in the, uh, during the hot spell months. Uh, from June to uh, August in Malaysia, that's not always the case, but once in a while. So you can imagine how you know uh, you know the pavement goes through all these environmental issues. Not 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 only in Malaysia, almost everywhere we have this uh, you know climatic condition. All right, now uh, these are the uh, uh, I'm sure those uh, of us in this field will never. <laughs> We'll never forget this and it will be with us forever, I think. The problems that we are facing on the road, potholes, cracks, uh, rotting, all right? We are trying trying uh, as much as possible to minimize all these problems on the, on the road so that people can have a comfortable and safe driving. But we will see, uh, uh, we're doing the best we can. Now, uh, apart from that, now, this is the background of the uh, fibermetric asphalt technology that was uh, developed way back uh, 20 years back in Malaysia. And I, I think I mentioned this before to uh, some of you who joined uh, in this uh, previous webinar. Uh, you know, we have this uh, oil palm trees in Malaysia, all right? And uh, of course, Malaysia uh, used to be one of the largest uh, producer of uh, palm oil in the world, and I hope it is still so, all right? Now, one of the uh, key elements for the uh, production of cellulose fiber is the, uh, what do you call the uh, empty fruit bunch fiber. Now, once the fruit is taken out, we are left with the empty fruit bunch, which, which uh, used to be the, uh, uh, the waste material those days, but that in fact uh, has become valuable nowadays and that can be uh, converted to vascular bun bundle fibers through steam expl uh, explosion. And then uh, it goes through several processes of uh, pulping. And finally, we end up with the uh, appropriate uh, cellulose fibers for use in road construction. We are going to look at that uh, to some extent, All right? Okay, now what I'm going to cover uh, shortly will be the uh, novel characteristics of uh, fibromastic asphalt, starting with the uh, characterization of cellulose fibers. Um, and then we uh, look into how these uh, cellulose fibers perform in the asphalt mixtures. 
and some uh, priorly assessments uh, towards the end. Yeah. Okay. Now the uh, processing techniques. Uh, this is part of the characterization, initial characterizations of uh, cellulose oil palm fibers. Now, uh, uh, apart from the uh, initial investigation or testing and analysis, we have the uh, scanning electron microscope that played an important role in the, uh, uh, what you call uh, production uh, analysis, quality control of the uh, material for use in uh, asphalt mixtures. And then we will look into the uh, uh, binder retention and dispersion of uh, the uh, cellulose in asphalt binders. Yeah? Now, uh, I do not know, some of you already attended the uh, webinar one before, and there are several processes I, I mentioned uh, in terms of pulping. One is the uh, a more mechanical pulping. This is a refiner mechanical pulping and then the chemical and the uh, TMP comes back with more refining uh, process and the RMP uh, uh, comes back with more refining uh, process and finally the uh, chemical refined, chemically refined cellulose fiber. The idea is to be able to get the uh, alpha cellulose in uh, large quantities for use in uh, road construction, right? Now what we are going to look at next is Right, how the uh, scanning electron microscope becomes uh, very important is to be able to uh, look at the uh, structure of the uh, fiber, assuming that the fiber, the, the uh, manufactured, screened, and produced fiber is already selected for use. Then it goes through this scanning electron microscope uh, study, whereby we look at the uh, texture, the size which are all very important, and above all the uh, fluffiness, just like the uh, cotton material, we make it more fluffy, all right? The fluffiness gives the uh, retention ability of the fibers in uh, asphalt mixtures. And uh, the, other, uh, the other important characteristic is, you know, we are going to roll and compact the asphalt mixture with the fiber at the site, even in the uh, laboratory, uh, uh, mixing and compaction, we use the uh, Marshall or gyratory compactors, and that there is a tendency for the uh, cellulose fiber, fibers to be uh, uh, damaged. So we need to look at that too. Not all fibers will withstand the uh, compacting effort uh, during mixing or laying in compaction outside. So by looking at the fiber before and after compaction, after compaction is simply the uh, uh, the uh, fibers are extracted from the asphalt mixture to see if there's going to be any cracking and peeling. So this is a sort of a, a main sort of aspect of uh, uh, producing quality fibers for use in uh, construction. Now, uh, fibers, uh, there are several fibers in use today uh, in uh, road construction. Uh, right, it can be synthetic and it can be other fibers, but uh, some technologies use the fiber for drain down purposes only. So again, this is also a requirement here since fiber is used in the asphalt mixture. So by looking at the uh, various pulping process, it can be clearly seen that because of the fluffiness, the texture and so on, chemically refined fiber tend to give the uh, sort of uh, lower drain down potential. In other words, the ability of this uh, particular process to retain the uh, binder in the asphalt mixture is high. So if we look at uh, the, uh, uh, the fiber characteristics in another form will be the retention ability of the uh, fibers. So we would like to keep the uh, binder in the asphalt mixture or the uh, road for as long as, you, as we want, but quite, Unfortunately, because of the uh, uh, loading environment, excellent loading environment, uh, construction practices, material qualities, and even the environmental condition tend to uh, degrade the uh, material and we get into a, a lot of problems on the road. Yeah? Okay, so again, the uh, chemical re chemically refined fiber tend to give the uh, highest retention of oil or binder in the uh, asphalt mixture, all right? So one of the uh, aspects that was looked into before, there was 
that's many years ago, uh, to see whether the fibers can be uh, mixed homogeneously uh, in the asphalt mixture. In other words, we need to have a good dispersion of these uh, micro-sized fibers uh, in the asphalt mixture. So that was done with uh, uh, the, the binder and the fiber itself using, using the spectral analysis and absorbance. And uh, of course, uh, any percentage of uh, micron size fibers above one percent can be give problem so you can say that not going beyond one percent by weight of aggregate uh, will give a good dispersion of this particular fiber and this particular size i'm not saying any fiber so that as uh, you have to be careful about that right okay now let's look at uh, some of the uh, MA, fma mixture requirements here yeah? Now, this is the uh, typical requirement that was developed many years ago, and this is already part of the uh, Malaysian uh, public works standard yeah, here in Malaysia. So uh, the uh, cost aggregate requirement is slightly uh, more than the uh, traditional mixtures, that is the dense gradient mixtures. Yeah. So slightly more, uh, about 70% or more. The bitumen airs, we don't really need very, uh, what do you call, uh, high viscosity bitumen for this particular purpose. Uh, a uh, 60, 70 penetration binder is good enough. Uh, now, we need to understand one thing here, the 60, 70 penetration with the uh, uh, fiber and the uh, appropriate whitened mineral aggregate to be able to give us sufficient mass to, uh, you know, for the uh, long lasting performance of this fiber mass stick. And then if you look at the filler here, right, of course, uh, the fiber mastic asphalt requires quite a bit of uh, fillers, anywhere between uh, 9 and 12%. Uh, and it, it, it is kind of difficult for us to get. Uh, like in Malaysia, we uh, commonly use granite for road construction. So uh, uh, the percentage of 75 micron and down from quarry operations is rather uh, small. <laughs> we have, uh, we get about 1.5 percent at the most. Yeah? So, in such a scenario, we need to use um, fillers from other sources. One good source is limestone powder, not hydrated lime, in my opinion, but it has to be a crushed calcium carbonate type of a material, which is in this case here, limestone powder. Even a ceramic uh, uh, powder, crushed ceramic powder, was blended with uh, limestone. Uh, for use in road construction. Uh, the idea is to be able to use uh, cheaper materials to uh, uh, come up with a uh, sort of a premium type of mixture here. And uh, cement can be used in this uh, mixture, but not beyond 2%. I need to understand that too much of cement in such a type of a mixture like fibromastic asphalt with, uh, uh, you know, uh, cost aggregate and uh, a lot of filler that may disrupt the mastic and uh, might get into very stiff mixture. Uh, we do not want to get into uh, premature failures due to high stiffness and so on. So that is the reason why if we need to use uh, cement for any reason, uh, it has to be limited to around. Yeah. Now, of course, uh, uh, through our study over the last many years, 0 0.4 to 0 0.6 tend to be the best uh, sort of range for to tackle uh, many different environments. For example, if you are looking at just an average uh, expressway a road, 0 0.5 uh, percent, uh, 0 0.4 percent is good enough. But if we are moving up to a real heavily loaded or road construction or resurfacing work like port areas and uh, even airports, then we might want to increase the uh, the fiber here, whereby the mastic itself will be increased. Yeah? So the idea is to be able to give a long lasting performance through the uh, filler mastic inside, yeah? the asphalt mixture. Okay, and then now uh, this is the uh, typical uh, uh, gradation uh, specification that was tailored many years ago based on the uh, quarry setups that we have here, yeah. all right? Uh, it is not that difficult to tailor the uh, gradation uh, uh, for use in uh, FMA in other countries, it shouldn't be a problem. So, uh, okay, we have uh, two types of uh, uh, fiber mastic asphalt here. 
uh, on on a lower side uh, expressways and so on fma 14 14 mm down uh, should be uh, good enough if you are looking at real heavily loaded uh, areas like port areas uh, the uh, fma 20 might be a, a good option with slightly higher fiber content and so on all right okay and then uh, more uh, specification on the uh, uh, cellulose fibers and what you see here is uh, this is our local requirement for the uh, of the uh, fiber here, yeah? and it has to, uh, in fact, go through uh, the uh, uh, 850 uh, micron size, 4 425, and 106 micron sizes here yeah? with the specific percentages here. So that will guarantee the uh, quality and the uh, performance of the fiber in uh, fiber mesh thick asphalt. And on one other thing is the uh, ash content. Make sure it is not more than 10 percent pH value around 7.5. Uh, 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 with the tolerance there and the absorption here. Yeah. Uh, like I said, the fluffiness, yeah. solid fibers without any absorption may become a problem too. There must be at least a micro absorption, you know, for the uh, uh, fibers to uh, retain the uh, binder in the asphalt mixtures. Yeah. So uh, again, there is a limit there, about 5%. Uh, moisture content shouldn't be more than 5%. Yeah. So that is one of the uh, uh, fibers specification for use in road construction. Now, what about the uh, fiber mastic uh, asphalt construction procedure? Now, is it going to be different from any other uh, technology that is available? Or will it be going to be uh, 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 different from the traditional asphalt mixtures? No, not at all. Uh, of course, uh, we know the uh, spray rate of tech road for road construction. So that is quite typical, 0 0.35 and 0 0.55 on the high, high side because of the uh, uh, requirement, nature of the job. If it's going to be a heavily loaded road, then we are looking into FMA 20 and probably uh, the uh, coating might differ a little bit. But again, the uh, SS type of uh, uh, tech code is good enough for this work. We are not looking to uh, uh, MS or RS and as you know that, SS is the uh, slow setting and the uh, MS is the uh, medium setting and the RS is the uh, rapid setting that tech code for uh, the uh, slow setting. Uh, tech code is good enough for this uh, technology. And what about the uh, rolling, yeah, compaction? Now, this is slightly different uh, from the uh, traditional conventional mixtures like the dense graded or hot mix asphalt uh, material. We just use the uh, uh, steel wheel uh, tandem rollers without a pneumatic rollers. There is no need for pneumatic rollers, right? Uh, something that we cannot do away with the uh, dense graded or the tradi traditional road con uh, construction uh, work. Uh, this is highly needed, but for this technology, this is not uh, required at all because of the uh, uh, slightly coarse metric in nature uh, doesn't really uh, uh, you know, need the, the needing action from the pneumatic rollers. Yeah, so that is, in fact, a uh, cost saving uh, from this technology. All right. Okay, in terms of a compaction temperature, unlike the traditional mixtures, where whereby uh, if the mixture, if the uh, trucks loaded with the asphalt mixtures uh, reaches the uh, uh, side. And with still with very high temperatures, there is no way we can compact it yet. And we have to wait for the temperature to uh, come down to a reasonable level so that we can compact again with the uh, pneumatic tire rollers uh, before we move into the uh, steel tandem rollers. But in this case, we can right away uh, roll and compact. There is no waiting period at all. Okay. So, uh, it can be compacted at high temperatures, and the uh, the uh, roller type uh, anywhere between 10 to uh, 12 tons is good enough. And uh, again, like I said, it is a very subjected to uh, the type of or the nature of work that are uh, that are undertaken uh, by any agencies uh, agencies, right? If uh, an uh, eight ton macadam a roller to be used, it can be, but need to look at the distance of uh, the side uh, or the location of the side from the uh, premix plant and so on. Uh, if it is very uh, you know, close by, 
again, we expect the temperature to be much higher and we can in fact go down with the uh, uh, a smaller uh, what do you call rollers here. Yeah? Okay, and uh, of course the traffic can be open uh, uh, as long as you know the temperature comes down to 60 and below. Okay, now uh, putting all this together, now this uh, technology has become very resilient and cost effective in the sense that we use the uh, uh, sustainable material here, which is the organic cellulose farm fibers. Like I said, not all fibers will work. It must go through uh, stringent quality control and need to look at the type of fibers uh, and for use. And then of course, uh, slight variations in the uh, degradation without uh, really compromising the existing procedure anywhere. Uh, okay. Uh, in the, with the uh, uh, premix and quarry uh, setup, yes. Yeah? So, uh, it is a doable thing, the slight variations only. And the other part is the uh, uh, the fiber, fiber mess as well. Then I need to move this. Uh, the uh, binder to, uh, uh, used in this mixture is the 60, 70 uh, type of uh, bitumen. And uh, this is highly recommended uh, here for use in Malaysia. Of course, we, if we are looking at a more premium type of mixtures nowadays, you know, with the polymer modified binder, of course, that's another uh, part of a scenario. But with the uh, fiber mastic asphalt technology, the yeah, PG76 is not necessarily just the 6070 penetration binder is good enough. Yeah? Again, the last part will be uh, the uh, simplicity of our construction here. So all of this will, uh, uh, you know, point towards a resilient uh, road construction uh, and cost savings, yeah? Okay. And then uh, let's look at the uh, performance requirement, all right? For traditional mixtures, of course, the uh, requirement, uh, you know, this is quite standard uh, in terms of the uh, voids uh, allowable in the compacted uh, road mixtures, typically between three and 5%. We don't want to offset that anyway. So the uh, fiber mastic as well is uh, the same uh, uh, in, in, in terms of construction. Now the resilient modulus requirement in Malaysia for the uh, typical traditional mixture, it is about uh, uh, 2,500 megapascal minimum. But in this case, uh, it's guaranteed that it will go past 3,500 megapascal. Yeah? So, uh, uh, it can be confidently used uh, that it will provide a high strength sort of technology. Yeah? Now, minimum stability typically it is 6.2, uh, you know, kilonewton and so on. And we moved up uh, to uh, 8 kilonewton nowadays. All right. And again, that uh, we, we, we would like to keep this to a uh, minimum 8,000 uh, newton or 8 kilonewton here. And the uh, flow, of course, uh, this is. Two to four mm maximum wind down ability of the fiber should be a, a zero point uh, uh, what do you call that then and the uh, allowable void of VTM uh, is again typical of uh, the dense graded mixtures here too and, and there is a slight uh, difference here in terms of VMA or voids in mineral aggregate and uh, for the typical dense graded mixtures due to its uh, in a high percentage of fines and lower percentage of cost aggregate, we are looking at a lower VMA. But here we are introducing fiber to up, up to a certain uh, level to form that mystic. The VMA requirement is slightly higher. That is the reason why we have a slight increment in the uh, cost aggregate nature here. So the minimum requirement for voids in mineral aggregate is about 17%. Uh, all right, that should be enough to provide that uh, fiber mesh stick uh, and, uh, and that should take care of the uh, uh, fiber retention, uh, sorry, the uh, binder retention in the uh, road mixture. Uh, and, and we expect that to uh, ensure what you call uh, long lasting pavement. Uh, Five, a little bit on the, yeah, yeah. Five, Five. minutes. Sorry, oh, okay, thank you, thank you. Okay, let's look at the trial lay assessment uh, a little bit here, all right? Uh, since we are running a uh, short of time and we can always uh, look into that in the uh, next uh, 
Tibetan and so on, uh, right? Uh, this this was done in uh, Sanai Desaru Expressway, uh, I think almost two years ago. And the site that was given uh, to us was really bad with very poor soil condition, almost like peat soil and uh, marine clay. And intentionally, the site was intentionally selected uh, with bad conditions to prove a point here. And uh, that was done, all right? Now, if we look at the uh, assessment of the uh, trial uh, laid down two years ago, now you can see the stability value is very, very much high, all right, compared to the, of course, the minimum requirement uh, during construction was uh, eight kilonewton. And you can see this, you know, uh, these are several locations where this uh, fiber mastic asphalt was used. Uh, this is not the only uh, location in Johor, southern part of Johor, and uh, very close to Singapore with heavily loaded trucks and so on, yeah? All right, so there are other locations that I will not be able to share here, okay? And in terms of resilient modulus, which is one of the important parameters in paper design, and you can see that although the minimum was, you know, guaranteed was 3,500, the actual, even after two years, right, some locations show beyond 6,000 here. So uh, this is, uh, uh, you know, fiber mastic as well, that is. Uh, is proving its worth and uh, how much it is really uh, improving in terms of stability, 124%, nearly 124% with respect to the minimum requirement. And uh, if we look at the minimum requirement in Malaysia, 8 per Newton, that's about 74% increment in uh, performance uh, here. In terms of resilient modulus, 125%. Uh, if we look at the uh, traditional 2,500, if we stick to uh, FMA being 3,500, all right, then we get a 60% uh, increment. So uh, uh, this is the assessment, uh, you know, from uh, the, uh, the uh, particular location. There are a lot more other locations that can be shared as we go along with this webinar uh, later on. There are, these are the uh, other places where it's already like five uh, years now. Uh, definitely we'll share the uh, data later on. All right, this is also another five year uh, project uh, uh, going very well with uh, uh, good retention of the fiber there, all right? So, okay, and uh, strong interest, just to share with you, strong uh, high interest here uh, in the Middle East region the last uh, three years, and uh, because of the uh, arid regions and very high temperatures, uh, you know, recorded during summer seasons, where the uh, pavement temperatures can, can go up to even 72 degrees Celsius as per their record. So, uh, and again, uh, hopefully uh, things go, if I may, uh, go places, okay? I think this is just uh, uh, just the last uh, sort of uh, bit of uh, information here. How well the uh, Ethiopian uh, region fits into this uh, 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 requirement here. See, all around uh, the uh, what do you call uh, Ethiopia is quite similar. In fact, uh, with the red and orange or brown uh, colored area here, it's quite similar to Malaysia uh, with the rainfall condition and also uh, what do you call uh, the temperature. So it is. Uh, a uh, pretty much doable uh, uh, thing as far as the technology is concerned, but uh, there are other things to be looked into from uh, the other side. Okay, so much for the, uh, you know, for listening to the, uh, uh, my presentation here. I think uh, I have come to the last part here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for listening. If there are any questions, sure, we'll be able to take that. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Professor Ratna. Uh, in the meantime, we have quite a number of questions and comments piling up in the question answer section. And I'm asking now Dr. Gurmel and Meran to help me um, to help me through this as well. Um, let me open the question answer. Professor Ratna, maybe if you stop sharing your screen, uh, then we can- I, 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 I will do that. I know I have to stop come it. To the... Yeah, it is this. Into the oh. screen. We can see each yeah. other. Uh, okay. Thank you so much. Uh, Sorry, I'm going to take a drink here. Yeah? Sure. And in fact, I think I will. Uh, I will. Um, I saw a question for Dr. Gurmel first, uh, so we'll give you some time to. <laughs> no, sure, sure. Again. 
for um, thank you so much there was a lot of uh, interest um, interesting uh, comments in the chat and in the question answers about your presentation some questions are very technical i'm not sure we'll be able to answer everything but we will try meran help me out on this i saw a question sure. from dr gurmel as well yep. um, there was um, there was a question of somebody asking uh, about the working uh, packages and why uh, I think work package three in the present. Yeah, That's, so uh, Gormer, sorry, sorry, Susanna. Um, Gormer, question on um, anti-fraud system and why we use this term rather than the quality control. So if you can kindly answer that. that would yeah, be great. yeah, no problem. Um, the, uh, the the materials used in, in the mixes are very, very important in terms of making sure that they are of the right quality and so on. Now, but these components individually are expensive all, and the whole thing becomes cheaper because of durability and so on. So what we need to do is make sure that we use the right materials. Now, at the moment, the tests which have been undertaken by various authorities who use this uh, routinely are um, very sophisticated, a bit like the um, cyclotron or the neutron beam we use at the University of Birmingham. In fact, there are only a few facilities around the world that has that facility. And the purpose of that is to make sure that we have materials supplied from the right sources and that the mixed composition is correct. Now, the aim of this project is to firstly check that and then come out of it, we hope we will have something which can be used more routinely. So the outcome may be a routine test, but the, at the moment, the aim is to make sure that we have epoxy materials coming from the right sources and of the right quality. That's the reason it's at the moment called fraud, anti-fraud system and not routine testing. So routine testing will hopefully be a byproduct or a product of this work. Uh, but at the moment, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's not. So that's, I hope that's satisfactory. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Gurmel. Um, yes, I got my hands now on a couple of more questions uh, coming through Professor Ratna. Uh, first one, is it filler mandatory in design or FMA mix? And then what is the difference between SMA and FMA, excepting that natural fibers are used in FMA? And what are the constructability issues and long-term performance of FMA when compared to SMA? I think I, you covered a little bit of that during your presentation. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for the uh, question. Uh, uh, SMA, yes, there are some fibers being used in SMA. Uh, and the uh, main purpose of the uh, fiber in SMA is to uh, minimize the drain down of the uh, binder. Like I mentioned before, during uh, mixing and then transportation to the site might take like, you know, three hours or even more. And there is a tendency for the binder at high temperatures to drain down to the bottom of the uh, mass of material carried uh, in the uh, trucks. So uh, that is because of uh, uh, a slight increment in the uh, cost aggregate nature, which is quite close to the uh, fiber mass as well, yes. But uh, that was uh, the uh, purpose of the uh, fiber there. But fiber mastic asphalt has gone a step ahead of that. Apart from the uh, drain down, it is already the performance in terms of uh, what do you call, uh, uh, in terms of fatigue and uh, or writing or <clears throat> permanent deformation that I showed you, uh, the uh, fatigue and uh, uh, maybe I didn't show you the slide, uh, perhaps I can, uh, show more advanced performance slides later on. So the way uh, it was analyzed with the fiber was to be able to uh, quantify the fatigue and uh, rotting potential of this fiber modifier as well beyond the uh, 0.3%, all right? So uh, it, it uh, easily went beyond the uh, 1.0 and 2.2 before and after aging for rotting. And it went up very high, all the way close to uh, 5,000 kilopascal for 
fatigue without uh, going beyond 5,000 since that is the limit. So that is the uh, difference here. And the other difference is the uh, void in mineral aggregate that I mentioned. So fibromastic asphalt VMA is slightly higher to be able to incorporate additional fiber for performance purpose and not only for the uh, grain down. So these are the uh, some of the differences uh, we, we see here. And in terms of the uh, gradation, it is a tailored gradation matrix to suit the uh, local condition here and uh, without giving too much of a tolerance, like wide angle, wide sort of uh, spectrum of uh, specification. So it has to be slightly uh, smaller in terms of specification tolerance so that we can guarantee the uh, what you call performance and so on. In terms of constructability, all right, of course, uh, there are some key elements to uh, take care. Yes, as I may, uh, uh, the uh, construction is about the same, but here, uh, you know, before we get out of uh, the premix plant, there are a couple of uh, in detail tests to be done. Samples will be taken out from the uh, premix plant or from the plant trial, and quick extraction of uh, the fiber will be done to make sure the fiber is, is in good shape, which is not uh, mandatory for SMA. So, because for SMA, it is just a drain down. For FMA, we are looking at uh, fatigue and rutting performance. So that is the reason why uh, samples must be extracted, all right, uh, uh, from samples taken from the upfront. So these are some of the, uh, what you call differences here was the, uh, and uh, big surprise, you know, a, a more philomastic, uh, uh, material within the uh, uh, what you call uh, formulated voids. Yeah? I hope I've answered that. Thank you, Professor Ratna. In the meantime, the more you speak, the more we get uh, uh, comments and, and, and questions. Sure, sure. Sure, sure. Certainly, um, it, it's clear there's a lot of interest and, and uh, we'll make sure we um, we cover some of those issues that you're raising in the, both in the chat and the question and answers in the, in the next webinar. We still have a couple of minutes. Professor Ratna, maybe um, I'm, I'm, I'm bundling here a, a couple of questions um, in the interest of time. As somebody's also asking, um, well, complimenting you for the presentation, which is extremely interesting, and asking uh, whether you have made any noise measurements on the, um, like the S PBI on the payment in question. There were a couple of questions as well. Um, I think that was answers as well, answered as well during your presentation on um, how about using this type of uh, technology in countries like India, where you have temperatures that go up to 45 um, uh, Celsius. And, yes. and uh, one last uh, question was also about uh, the type of traffic volumes and the percentage of heavy vehicles uh, in the trials that you were referring to in your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Susanna. I, I, I think we have to go one by one to <laughs> even oh, write down the questions. Yeah. The first question is, <laughs> yeah, go ahead. The, the first question was, I didn't write that down. The, the first question was about um, whether you have made any... Uh, oh, the yeah, noise. Okay, well, I, I, I get it. Yes, get yes, it. yeah, yeah, to answer that. Yes, we have done a lot of uh, what you call uh, uh, noise level analysis test and analysis over so many years, in fact, uh, even now, once in a while, we carry that out. Uh, uh, and we found that the uh, the acoustic noise in terms of decibel is, is 20 to 25% lower, unlike the, uh, the traditional, you know, uh, uh, mixtures or root surface may give uh, 60 to 70 uh, uh, decibel and so on. This is a lot lower. It will be very quiet. People uh, here in Malaysia, you know, traveling on that you know, segment, they say, you know, of course, they will be traveling on other areas and suddenly on this uh, track, they will, they will they feel the uh, quietness of the uh, pavement surface without any corrugation, ripples, uh, any undulation. It's fairly flat and nice to travel. Okay, the other question is... <laughs> The other question was about uh, the possibility to use this type of technology in, in India. India, where you have really very, very yes, okay. 
Now, uh, that's a good question. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mentioned that earlier. Uh, you know, there's a lot of interest in, uh, you know, coming from Middle East where the uh, temperature gets very high, all right? Uh, we are looking at uh, pavement temperatures. But if pavement temperatures beyond 70, when we say 45 degrees Celsius, if, if that's going to be, are they talking about ambient temperatures like 40, 45? So if so, the pavement, temp pavement temperature is going to be beyond 70 degrees Celsius. So that's very high. So uh, to construct typical pavement there, you know, binder gets very soft. And when binder gets, the binder in the asphalt road gets soft with the uh, heavily loaded trucks flying over it and we get rutting problems and so on and that is the reason why for high temperatures we may have to see uh, uh, what he called change to a more post aggregate type of uh, a resilient type of mixtures like fma with higher uh, force aggregate and more filamentic asphalt inside that will, uh, in fact, uh, increase the uh, softening point uh, in question. Yeah? So in other words, even at high temperature, temperature, the pavement is expected to uh, minimize rutting or permanent deformation along the wheel path. Thank the you very one. much, Professor. That, that's one and more. The last one. 58 here was about traffic volumes and uh, if, if you can get give a, a sense of the type of traffic volumes in the trials that you were uh, presenting yeah okay thank you now if you look at the uh sanai desaru expressway uh the uh, southern part of Johor, it is more like an urban expressway too, very close to Singapore, and a lot of containers moving, you know, back and forth over the uh, stretch. Uh, you can understand, uh, you know, Singapore and uh, the southern part, which is Johor and that has like uh, on the average like four lanes uh, in total. In some places, six lanes, and uh, easily more than uh, you know, ten percent trucks flying, uh, you know, with all the articulated props and beyond. Uh, uh, for imagination. So, uh, yes, yes, so th th those are all heavily loaded area and uh, specifically selected to prove a point, like I said, with all the bad condition selected for FMA, all right, with poor ground <laughs> uh, that used to fail all the time. Now it's already two years of still performing. Yeah? Touch wood, yeah. Thank you very much, Professor Ragnar. Oh. I think we'll, we'll give you a break. Uh, there's, plenty of, there's plenty of questions actually coming uh, forward, uh, but we need to wrap up. It's 9.59 uh, here in Geneva, uh, and we're getting to the end of this, uh, of this webinar. Um, I suggest that uh, we will uh, take the opportunity to use the LinkedIn group to address also some of the questions we're not able to address today and so that others can benefit ex as well from these uh, very fruitful exchanges. Thank you so much to all the speakers and, and all the participants. Before you leave, <laughs> before you leave, um, let me uh, remind you a couple of things. First of all, help us uh, please ameliorate as well uh, these webinars. There will be a, a third webinar coming up uh, uh, soon and we'll be uh, notifying you uh, for that. Um, um, I have posted in the chat the link that will allow you to uh, quickly fill in before you leave the evaluation form. Please open your chat. You will see a message in capital letters and uh, please click on that link. It will open up a Microsoft form. It takes you really two minutes to fill it in um, and it will allow you to give us some suggestions uh, for the, um, the next webinars we'll be organizing. I'll start resharing my screen as well. I want to bring you to your attention again. We can share, sorry. Uh, I think you can see my screen, correct? Yes. Okay, Meran, can you give me a sign? Are you seeing my screen now? I do, yes, thank you, yeah. Uh, perfect, thank you. Um, a quick reminder as well, we do have uh, information on the project uh, on the University of Birmingham website and uh, access to all the proceedings of the first webinar we hosted in December on IRF, uh, uh, irfnet.ch website. We'll be posting as well 
the uh, presentations and the recordings of this webinar as well on the IMF website. You will be notified uh, as well when this will be um, available. And again, I want to remind to everyone to, uh, to connect with us and get engaged uh, and involved in the project via the LinkedIn, uh, LinkedIn uh, group. I think we get to the end with this one. Third webinar coming up uh, soon will be uh, sharing with you uh, dates and topics, but please make uh, make sure you use the LinkedIn group as well to provide us some suggestions uh, on topics you would like us to cover going forward with uh, with this series of webinars within the the CRIPS. Um, I'd like to thank all of you for uh, being with us today. I still see uh, hundreds of people connected from all over the world. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to all the speakers uh, for the uh, effort. Thanks, Meran and. Uh, and the team in the University of Birmingham, as well as to my team for putting this event uh, together. And to thanks as well to the High Volume Transport uh, Program and UK Aid uh, who are funding uh, this project. With this, I wish you a good continuation of your day or your evening, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll be in touch uh, soon. Please make sure you fill in the evaluation form. I'll leave the uh, connection open uh, still a little bit for those who want to access the evaluation form. The link again is provided in the chat. Thank you so much and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thanks, Thank everyone. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone.